Hey everyone, welcome back to The Grit Files. I am your host, Laurel and Mears, and in the house today, we've got Colin Doretta. He is a co-founder of a company called Finn, which we're going to dig into, but he's also the CEO and co-founder of Innovation Department. And what's really big about that is that earlier this year, they celebrated their 10th anniversary. That's not an achievement you see all that often, so we're going to dig into that. Plus, oh yeah, in his spare time, he also writes as part of Forbes and the advisory council there. He's also a journalist with Inc., Entrepreneur, TechCrunch. You will see his articles everywhere. So with that, Colin, welcome to The Grit Files. Thank you so much for having me, Colin. Well, as I said, it's always exciting to have these chances to speak with different founders who are at different stages of their journeys. They are many of them. I've started early. And every once in a while, we get people like yourself who have done a number of things. Like you describe yourself as a reformed investment banker, <laughs> right? And now you're on this side, not only making investments, but doing things and really expanding your understanding of the markets and fundraising and helping others. So talk to us a little bit about your focus and what you're doing right now with Innovation Department and Finn. Sure, you bet. Um, so, so as you mentioned, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Innovation Department. Uh, what we are is a venture studio, um, which you know, kind of sits somewhere in between a holding company and an incubator. Most incubators bring in external entrepreneurs um, who already have an idea. We generally home grow the idea and um, find entrepreneurs or actually entrepreneurs come from uh, team members within the innovation department ecosystem already who might have had a yearning or interest to ultimately be the guy or gal that leads a brand. Um, so we built five businesses at this point. Our first business, WellPath, which was a nutritional supplement company we sold last year. Um, we've been super fortunate to have some modest success on, on both sides of the business in terms of both our business building and the investing work we do. We've probably invested in around 50 businesses at this point. Um, and, and, you know, fortunately, a lot of what have now become household names. Uh, we're, we're pretty industry agnostic, though our roots were in consumer and consumer tech, though, you know, circuitously, we've started to spend more and more time in industries like fintech, and we're even starting to touch Web3. All right, Colin, give us a little bit of description in and around the kinds of things that you do with your day-to-day. -day. So in my day-to-day -day at this point, I'm straddling the line between our investment side uh, and our business building side. We have CEOs which run each of our portfolio companies. So I really act as a board member for each of those. Um, but at times when it's recruiting or fundraising time, then I get much, much more involved. All right. So with that, and you've made 50 investments, so people don't get invested like every single person that comes in, right? You got to go through a lot of filtering. And so you talk to a lot of founders every single day. We're just going to jump right to the advice part of the show, Colin. What do you think that the founders should know, but they don't when they come to you looking for investment? Sure. Uh, I think, you know, I like to say it, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And uh, I think sometimes people pay lip service to that, but don't really mean it. Uh, I really encourage people not to fall prey to the false narratives out there that suggest everyone is working 100 hour work weeks. Uh, I think it's really important for people to work in such a way that they can maintain the pace for the better part of a decade. As the data substantiates, that's generally how long it takes to take a business from inception to exit. So all these stories that we hear of someone getting to an exit in three years are the exception, not the rule. With that in mind, understand that while you sometimes might need to work very hard, most of the time you need to put in consistently hard but sustainable effort. That's really key. And the other piece of that equation is that not only does it take 10 years to find that success, 92% don't get past the first year. Right. I think uh, in, in, in 
that's for a myriad of reasons. Sometimes that's also just because people burn out over the course of that first year. Uh, but I, I think you normally have a realization of whether something's going to get some degree of product market fit pretty quickly. And so you can make a decision whether you're going to stick with it. But by year two or three, as you're growing, as presumably now you're venture funded, et cetera, um, then it becomes really incumbent upon you to find a means of working that you can work hard but intelligently while maintaining some balance in one's life. Um, and, and anyone who's dubious of that notion, I'd really encourage them to go read some of the research on all the deleterious effects of things like poor nutrition and lack of sleep on work, work quality. Uh, ultimately, entrepreneurs, more than almost anyone else, succeed or fail on the quality of your idea. So really finding balance, making sure that you're sleeping, making sure you're eating well, finding time for you know loved ones, family, friends, whatever that might be are all super critical components to ultimately building a successful business. Absolutely. And it's not easy for a lot of people. And so I think we want to have words of encouragement also for our listeners, but it can be done, right? Like it's oxygen mask theory, help yourself so that you're in a position to be able to do what you want to do, do what you choose to do and be able to help others or do whatever else. All right. Flipping things around a bit. Now we're going to point things back at you because you have been in business for a while but along the way, I am sure, because every business owner does, you've had one of those like, oh, crap, WTF moments where something threw you for a big loop and you had to navigate it. Can you talk to us about something that's that's happened that comes to mind? Sure. Um, first of all, there's a lot um, because invariably, you know, success is never a straight line. I think that's another thing that the popular literature on startups does a bit of disservice to of uh, it suggests that you know most of the people who made it big made it big very quickly i think in practice you you fail 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 and then you have one thing that ultimately is that last piece of the puzzle that comes together and suddenly things start working really well so in my uh probably two years into my experience building my first business well path um, I was only a few years out from leaving what was a lucrative career in finance to embark on this entrepreneurial journey. We'd finally launched to the public. And after what felt like was an avalanche of positive press and all this initial excitement, we suddenly realized no real customers were showing up at our doorstep. I, like many first time entrepreneurs I know, believed our product to be so special that people were going to seek us out. You know, how can't they? right? We've built something that's so novel, so compelling. In practice, the vast majority of the time, no matter how great your product is, you still need to figure out a compelling way to sell it. And that can be a really tough realization when you're in my shoes, because we had no marketing strategy whatsoever. Uh, and, and even though we started to realize the error of our ways, I wish I could say we figured it out quickly thereafter. But really, it took us another couple of years before we really solved the riddle of how to sell to customers. And at that point, we were able to scale from basically a million of revenue into the eight figures in less than a year. And that's the case in point of we just stayed in the game and we were working at such a pace that we kept our heads above water long enough to have the eureka moment where we started to really figure things out and the business really came together. Oh. That's just so heartening to hear. So for the listeners that have been with me for a while, they know I'm also a founder. I've struggled a bit with product market fit and all the rest of that stuff, bootstrap, blah, blah, blah. And it's just great to hear that there is hope, right? There are these examples. It's not just everybody. I mean, they make it sound like it's just like social media. It's this curated micro slice of lives of utopia, right? Where People don't show anything for seven or eight days in between where they're stuffing their faces with potato chips. They can't get out of bed. They've got all <laughs> kinds of things going on, but they show you, look, I'm all dressed up and I'm fabulous. But meanwhile, stuff's going on. And it's the same thing that you hear with the founder stories. Everybody sounds like they're doing something amazing. They made a million dollars the first time they reached out to ask for a sale. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. all this sort of stuff, right? I'm exaggerating, but there you go. So the to totally, I think uh, that the hustle porn culture that is, <laughs> very real out there um is you know engenders insecurity and a false sense of what's actually happening 
And I think so much of entrepreneurial culture, particularly on social media, revolves around that. So the more you can off its influence and realize that the vast majority of successful entrepreneurs, not just the people who struggle, but the, the most successful ones had a really hard time being successful. And almost every story you read, if they're being authentic, there were probably several times where they screwed up to a magnitude where they almost lost their business. Um, you know, I, I suspect that no small number of your listeners have read Chew Dog by, by Phil Knight. Yes. And, you know, he talks about several times where he was on the brink of losing the business. And, and here, you know, many years later, obviously, he now has, um, you know, probably the most well-recognized brand in the world. So I think that's something that everyone should keep in mind is just because things might be going sideways in any given mo moment, um, you are not alone and that does not make you uh, somehow deficient. Ah. Uh. Love that last line, right? You are not less than. This shit is hard, right? Like bottom line, that's that's <laughs> just where it is. All right, I'm giving you an undo button right here. And so for our, our, our listeners that can't see this, I'm tapping my little white button. Colin, you got to undo one thing in your life, what, personally or professionally, whatever you're comfortable sharing. What are you undoing? Boy, I, I think it's... Um... And, and again, this kind of ladders into there's just so many uh, small mistakes that I've made. So it's not an undo of a mistake. It's an, rather an undo of uh, a, a behavior, if you will. And and which is to say there are so many mistakes that I made by virtue of not taking the time to process and think through my decision, but rather behaving more reactively. I'm a big believer that there is value in trusting your gut. So I'm not suggesting that your gut and your intuition will not serve you well, but I have always benefited from perhaps listening to my gut, then taking time to reflect and only then coming to a decision when I'm reactive, even if I think I'm you know, being thoughtful, making a good decision. And I'm, and I'm not suggesting these are times when there are even heightened times of whether it be anxiety or emotions, but just in general, taking time for reflection always serves me well. And there are more times than I can count that I did not do that and ultimately came to regret it. As you're saying that, I was thinking of all of these places I swam uh, as a child in Northern Ontario, Canada, where it said like, look before you leap, right? Because there's tons of granite and rocks and boulders and stuff that you're going to go into. And that was the the visual that I had in my head. I as think that's a that. perfect metaphor. <laughs> All right. Next question. I've got a magic wand and I'm waving it here. Who do you wish is listening to this podcast right now? Uh, you know, ultimately, I think for personally, anyone who's really struggling in the entrepreneurial grind, uh, I believe there's a predisposition toward that hustle culture that we talked about, um, where most founders who've had an exit, don't really speak about it. The ones who do are generally talking about their giant wins and how hard they worked and how easy it was. Um, uh, I, I think that is the presiding entrepreneurial culture right now, this idea that if you're not working for 20 hours a day, you're somehow slacking. And it's really a dangerous ideal to set and, and frankly, not even a real one. I think there is so much virtue signaling out there. Um, and I know tons of successful entrepreneurs, you know, orders of magnitude more successful than I am, who have been really hard workers, but didn't forego family and other interests while they were building their businesses. And then uh, similarly in, the, in that vein, uh, the most successful people I've seen are rarely the smartest. Um, so I think there's also this misconception out there that, you know, if, if you're not uh, a polymath, you know, you can't go build uh, a successful business uh, in a technical field. And again, that's just not true. So hopefully people who um, might have, oh, fallen prey to believing those notions a little bit are, are hearing this and are like, you know, okay, I, I agree with this guy. Like if he can be successful, he doesn't sound any smarter than me. Um, and it sounds like he's probably made just as many mistakes, if not many more than I, I have. So there's no reason I can't go do it as well. Uh -huh. Now I'm curious, do you think luck plays into this? Unequivocally. Uh, I, I, you know, 
there was a, a very successful founder who was asked the same question and uh, this person responded kind of effusively like, no, I make my own luck. And, you know, in, in some circumstances, sure, right? I think putting yourself in the right place such that you can get to be lucky. Uh, but at the same time, you know, where you're born, um, your ability to get a good education, right? The people whom you've happened to meet um, who perhaps became your mentors or your investors. I mean, can you engineer some of that? Sure. But but no small amount of that also is, you know, a certain measure of good luck. And I, I also think that, you know, I'm a big believer in staying fairly humble and, and it takes a lot of hubris to sit around and be like, no, I created it all myself. Yeah, I, I'm on the anti-hubris camp uh, as a former employee of Sun Microsystems, where the world's first Fortune 100 CEO that quit via Twitter, uh, <laughs> you know, th that was that whole scene, right? So talk about some hubris there. So that said, what's your kryptonite? What takes you out at the knees? Hmm. Uh, you know, I, I think one thing I've learned about myself is... I am better at starting things than finishing them, so to speak. Uh, I've done a lot of personality assessments. I've spent no small amount of time with coaches. Uh, and I think one thing I've acknowledged about myself is that I love the startup phase of the business a great deal more than, you know, what I would characterize sometimes the day-to-day -day drudgery of operations once you're years in. Um, it's part of why I'm spending more of my time investing now. I also enjoy my time being able to drop into, um, you know, some of our portfolio companies and have a bigger impact when I get a chance. Um, and I think, therefore, you know, my kryptonite, the way to really lose my interest is, is getting me lost in endless operational meetings where I'm dealing with the business minutiae. And, you know, I just have such a hard time engaging in those for any sustained period of time. Oh, bingo, bingo. I am an innovator and ideator and I loathe administrivia. It's, it is my, my death knell. Just, just can't do it. <laughs> Colin, how have you changed since this journey began where, like you said, you became a reformed investment banker, left the hustle and bustle and craziness of Wall Streets and financial firms and all of that sort of good stuff and went down your own path. How have you changed? Sure. Uh, I've been at this for nearly 10 years, so I, I like to be believe that I've evolved in many ways. Uh, you know, importantly, I've done a lot of self-work to become a better leader, a better entrepreneur, and, and most importantly, a better person. And, and that's included attending courses like uh, one that I'm up at uh, Harvard Business School right now, actually, uh, alongside, as I mentioned before, working with a coach and being really intentional about finding specific areas of focus for my growth. So I think intentionality in everything that I've done has dramatically shifted from when I first started doing this to where I am today. I think that's partly by virtue of the, I'm just 10 years older. It's also, you know, when you have less time and you're trying to achieve a lot, if you're not intentional about what you're doing and how you're spending your time, you're not really going to get anything done. Um, by way of example, Every quarter now, I build up a learning syllabus, which is intended to provide a roadmap for how I can learn a specific subject that, that I um, that has to do with some part of myself that I really want to elevate or strengthen. Uh, so again, it's being super conscious about all these ways to continue growing who I am. And, and hopefully that makes me a better leader and just a better person all around. Oh, yes, because everything takes work. Most of us are not natural born leaders and fabulous at everything we do. Uh, I, I would argue almost not, no one is. Um, and anyone who believes themselves to be is generally deluding themselves, right? And, and they might be relatively good at it, but they'll quickly be surpassed by someone who's willing to put in the effort. I think that's a through line of everything I've seen in life is people with latent talent if they continue to build on that talent, they can kind of stay ahead of the curve. But a lot of people with latent talent believe themselves to have that talent and therefore uh, end up actually, relatively speaking, behind the people who spend a lot of time working on it. <laughs> All right. So here we go. 
turning the tables around. How can our audience help you? Anything we can do for you? Uh, honestly, no. I think, you know, it, to the extent anyone ever um, has anything that they'd like to ask me, if I can be helpful. Uh, I love connecting with people, building cool things. So I'd love to encourage your audience to you know, shoot me an email or, or a note on social media or what have you. Um, and if I can provide some insight or, or just share some war stories. So perhaps we all feel a bit more camaraderie. I'd be happy to do so. Fabulous. Now, this is the last question. We're going to bring it home here. This is my signature question of the Grit Files. We are now taking a look deep into the dark corners of your closet. And we are looking for a pair of footwear, boots, whatever, shoes, whatever it is that best personifies who you are, Colin Doretta. What are we looking at and why does that pair of shoes, boots, whatever it is, represent your personality and the essence of you? Boy, uh, that that's a tough one. Um, I think, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, I, I have, and in fact, I'm wearing them now because I'm going to be heading to the gym shortly thereafter. Um, but it's, it's my um, Project Rock Under Armour sneakers. Um, and the reason for that being is I am, and then anyone who knows me knows that I'm an enormous uh, fan of Dwayne Johnson. Uh, I think there's no one working today who's proven his doubters wrong time and again in, in such impressive fashion. Uh, he's probably the definition of a multi-hyphenate. He went from a football player for a national championship team, transitioning to wrestling and becoming the biggest draw that sport's ever seen. Subsequently, being the highest paid movie star, now flourishing as an entrepreneur who's built a multi-billion dollar empire. So I just love that this guy stands for um, you know, someone who at every juncture hears people telling you to stay in your lane, telling you you can't do it. And in spite of that, not only does he go do it, but he has maintained a super strict moral compass and treats everyone with the utmost dignity and respect. And I like to believe on a much, 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 much smaller scale um, that I've tried to emulate much of he, what he's done, but most importantly, uh, really emulate the the commitment to, uh, you know, treating people in an ethical way and behaving in such a way that I can look at myself in the mirror every night and be really proud of the person I am. Oh, he is quite the model. I really, really do like him a lot. And he's a girl dad. I'm part of three sisters there's three daughters so my dad's a super girl dad so i'm all for all the girl dads out there <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean he's the quintessential guy who looks tough and then is a total softy when when you actually learn a little bit about him yeah he wears princess dresses when his daughters ask him to go exactly to i mean they're you know come on how and, could you not and, like the and, guy and you know, duets he, moana with pretty great that's right he gives away trucks he does he, he's just he's amazing just an amazing human and if you're modeling that, then Colin sounds like you're an amazing human too. And we're lucky that we've had you on our show today. So with that, this is a wrap of the Grit Files. Again, Colin Doretta, CEO and co-founder of Innovation Department and co-founder of Finn. Thank you so much for being on our show today and all the best of luck to another 10 years with your business, even though it might mean a little more operational stuff. <laughs> Thank you, Laura Lynn. Thank you for having me. And how about that fantastic intro by Touch Circle?